Hi, I have a four-year-old son. If I'm lucky, by the time I die, he'll be about my age. If I could see him then, I'd struggle to understand the way that he interacts with his world as human behavior as I understand it now. A couple of years ago, when he was two, I bought a touchscreen tablet and I showed him a cartoon on it. When it had finished, he reached out and pressed the thumbnail of the one he wanted to watch next. I think the implications of that instinctive correct action are profound. And for me, they mark the start of the disappearance of the boundary between the information world and physical systems. The emotive headset can measure the magnetic waves created by my thoughts sensitively enough for a computer attached to them to understand the direction that I'm thinking about. This technology has been used to help completely paralyzed people to communicate. So my thoughts can influence information. And information can influence the physical world in increasingly interesting ways. The 3D printer that you see here can create objects such as prosthetic limbs from digital designs. 3D printers have also been used to create living tissues such as skin and muscle fiber, one cell at a time. These are striking technologies. And over the course of the next few years, they'll transform the way that we interact with information and the way that we interact with our environment. And as those interactions become so natural that we cease to be conscious of them, that's when we'll really feel the impact of the information revolution. And we need new ideas to face striking challenges. That Since the Industrial Revolution, we started building cities upwards around lifts powered by steam engines. Over the course of the last century, we've built them outwards around the motor car as we drive to work and to schools and to where we shop. We can only afford that lifestyle because its social and environmental cost isn't included in its financial price. And as the population of the world grows towards 2009 by about 2050, mostly in cities, in countries that it's increasingly inaccurate to call emerging, that illusion is going to be shattered. We can see this today. We're all paying more for our food and to heat our homes as a proportion of our income, and that's not going to change. So our choice or our challenge is to use these new technologies to make cities more efficient to make the supply chains that waste about 40% of the food that they produced while transporting it thousands of miles around the planet more efficient without endangering the billions of lives that they support. Or perhaps it will be to use artificial means to create food in laboratories, as has already been done. I think these choices will go to the heart of our relationship with the natural world, what it means to be human and to live in an ethical society. I call a city that's doing this successfully in a way that's sympathetic to the needs of its people and communities a smarter city. I'd like to explore three ideas for how it seems to me we can make our city smarter. The first of these is for little things and big things to work more constructively together. And I'll start with an analogy to, to physical systems. So, Top left of um, the screen here, you can see the ring road that was built around Birmingham in the post-war economy to support the flow of traffic around the city. Everyone knew that cars needed to drive that way, but it strangled the city centre because it wasn't sympathetic to the needs of people to walk about the city and interact through it. It was knocked down about a decade ago. More recently, city designers have experimented with innovations like this pedestrian roundabout in China, with Exhibition Road in London, or with Birmingham's East Side City Parks. These big infrastructures allow people to walk and cycle and interact with each other. People may be little, but were the most important things in cities, they're why they're there. And we have learned slowly how to build physical infrastructure to be sympathetic to us. Same challenge applies to technology. Just for a moment, let me talk about the great potential that technology offers to cities. We can measure data, like the position of a car, or the level of carbon dioxide. We can turn that data into information about how fast traffic is flowing or about the emissions of buildings. And we can draw information, draw insight from that information into the performance of a city, the impact of congestion on its economy or the impact on life expectancy of environmental quality. So this promise is leading us to deploy communications infrastructures such as broadband internet and 3G mobile throughout our cities. But what use is this infrastructure? if the people in a city can't afford subscriptions to a broadband network, or if businesses don't have access to computer programming skills to manipulate all this data. These are the challenges of the big infrastructures of the information revolution. And the way to solve them is to start with people and places. 
where the information infrastructures of a city are being created successfully. It's a through, through a process of listening and conversation of big things like technology companies and councils going into the places where people live and into the communities and hearing their challenges, hearing what they're trying to do. I spent a lot of time in Sunderland over the past few years in areas such as Hendon and in the Container City Incubation Facility for Social Enterprise that you can see here, creating these ideas or co-creating them with communities. In Dublin, this process of partnership between the city authority, the county councils, the local university, public and private service providers, communities and entrepreneurs has now resulted in a partnership that's sharing 3,000 sets of information about the city, using that information to discover new ways for its water supply and its transport to work more efficiently, and leading to the creation of new information-based businesses that are winning venture capital investment because the products and services they're building in Dublin can be resold to other cities across the world. So these are cities getting smarter using big infrastructures and putting the resources of big institutions into the hands of people in the places where they live. And they can create great new services. In, the, in San Francisco, we used algorithms that can measure and predict the flow of traffic in the future an hour in advance, very accurately, to tell commuters before they left the house every day how long their journey would take and how it would be affected by congestion that developed after they left the house. That gives them a new ability to choose not to travel when traffic's going to be bad, to work from home or to take a different route. And we can appeal to a sense of community. This picture of a water meter shows a householder in Dubuque how their water performance is um, can be interpreted. It can tell them if their washing machine's working inefficiently or if they've got a leak. But people given this information really start to make changes when you tell them something else. The green point score you see here is an anonymized aggregate of this household's performance against its near neighbors. And people with that information about how they're contributing to their community are about twice as likely to make changes in their behavior. This information is all about us. And it leads me to my second idea for how we create smarter cities, and that's the idea of producers and consumers. We all produce this information all the time whenever we share a photo in social media or buy or sell in an online marketplace. And as the boundary between information and the physical world disappears, that concept's going to apply to markets in all sorts of industries and all sorts of systems, from local food growing and processing to local energy creation from domestic solar power and bioenergy. It's already leading to new marketplaces in transport resources, such as return journeys in vans and private parking spaces in homes and in city streets, and in markets in the manufacture of 3D objects from digital designs, as you can see from these examples from Shapeways. What's really exciting, though, are innovations in currency and how they can support these markets. In Switzerland, a complementary currency called the Weir has been operating for nearly a century, contributing to economic stability by allowing some debt to be repaid by locally bartered agreement rather than in universal cash. Bristol became the fifth town and city in the UK to launch a local currency this year, and these schemes are increasingly using advanced technologies such as this smart po pardon me, smartphone payment scheme operated by Droplet in Birmingham and London. What these technologies offer is a chance to create rates of exchange that compare the complete social, environmental, and financial cost of goods and services to their immediate value to producers and consumers. It's the possibility to create marketplaces that really create sustainable city systems. But if this is a good idea, why isn't it ubiquitous already? And that leads me to the third idea, which is storytelling. Cities really make progress on this agenda when the owners of their resources across public and private sector find a way to use those resources and capabilities together in pursuit of a common vision and to an external investment in that vision. But doing so means that we don't just need the leaders of those institutions to commit to this idea. We need all of the stakeholders that they're accountable to support it to, to support it to, their employees, their shareholders, and the electorate. And we can only appeal to such a broad group of people if we appeal to some common instincts, a sense of narrative, and our ability to empathize. 
So rather than thinking about the technology of these infrastructures or the financial efficiencies that they can bring, we need to tell stories about how they can make businesses more successful as an information marketplace here in, operated by Warwick University is doing, creating new contracts and creating new jobs in small businesses in the West Midlands. We need to tell stories about how they can allow people access to affordable transport to places of employment and how they can help us live longer, independent and productive lives as the citizens of the retirement community in Bolzano, Italy are doing using remote health monitoring technology. These are the stories of smarter cities. It's a vital choice for us to take to start telling them. And it's actually one that we can all take to make a difference. Because it's not the responsibility of any one organization to make a city smarter. A council can't do it alone. A transport provider can't do it alone. It requires a new collaboration. And that collaboration can take place at any scale from the smallest social enterprise to the largest city community. And the technology we need to get started is the simplest of all, and it's freely available to us. Language used face-to-face -face in conversations. I can't imagine a more important thing than to choose to tell these stories and to help our cities get smarter. I hope that that's something that we can all start to do. Thank you.